Uh, can you hear me now? Or do I need to speak? No? Higher? I guess maybe I can hold it. Is it better now? Can, uh, can you hear me in the back? No? Okay. Okay, maybe I can just hold it in my hand. I think it would be easier. This is, let me try to put it somewhere, maybe central. It's, this is not very hard. What about now? Is it better? Okay, I will try also to speak a bit louder than I generally speak. And hopefully if you really cannot hear me, this makes sense and I will, I will try to be a bit louder. So in the, uh, these last two lectures of the school, uh, I'm gonna introduce some new capabilities that are implemented in EPW. And these capabilities allow to look at superconducting properties with um, uh, an isotropic resolution. Since I suspect that not everybody has worked with uh, superconductivity, I will start the presentation with an overview of uh, basically what is superconductivity and uh, what is the field of superconductivity at this point. Then I will overview the BCS theory of superconductivity and briefly mention the macmillan allendice formula for critical temperature that you have already seen in, uh, in um, one of the tutorials. And uh, uh, the central part of the talk will be the migdal elias ben approximation and the nambu gorkos formalism that put together allow to uh, derive uh, what is called the migdal elias ben equation. And finally, I will just uh, mention briefly Another method to investigate uh, superconductors from first principle, which is uh, density functional theory for um, superconductors. So uh, superconductivity is basically a quantum mechanical phenomena occurring in certain materials below a characteristic critical temperature. And at the macroscopic scale, there are two very intriguing manifestations that uh, uh, one can observe. So this. So one of them is this zero resistivity. So basically below the critical temperature, the electric current can flow without any resistance. And this was discovered in 1911 by Ons. Um, and then the second uh, manifestation is, for example, the perfect diamagnetic. So basically the um, a magnetic field is expelled from a superconducting state and this was discovered in 1933 by Meissner and Oceanfeld. So uh, since basically superconductors can carry very high current densities and can generate very high magnetic fields, they can find numerous applications. And currently, the largest market for, uh, for superconductors are MRI machines. But uh, for example, the large hydron collider in Europe would have not been possible without uh, using uh, superconducting magnets, and also for over a decade now we have magnetic uh, levitating trains. The reason why superconductors are not still not widely used is that because they operate at very low uh, temperature. So ideally, we would like to have superconductors that can uh, that can uh, uh, function at uh, room temperature, working at uh, nitrogen temperature. It would still be fine since nitrogen is, uh, is uh, cheap and uh, abundant. But unfortunately, as I said, the most, uh, the widely used com uh, commercial superconductor, they operate at helium temperature. And this is not sustainable in the long run because uh, helium is scarce and also expensive. Yeah? So we are gonna run out of helium at, um, at some point. So uh, traditionally the, oops, uh, the sorry, uh, um, the um, the progress in superconductivity is shown by a plot like this of critical temperature versus time. So as you can see here, until uh, 80s, the highest temperature te uh, critical temperature that was known uh, was around uh, 20 uh, 20 Kelvin. And I should mention that all these superconductors are what we call conventional superconductors. So the mechanism is 
due to the uh, it's phonon mediated, so it's due to the interaction between electrons and phonons, the lattice vibrations. Then in, the, in 1986, that was the first major breakthrough in superconductivity research when um, it was discovered that uh, the superconductivity in oxides was discovered. So very quickly, uh, the TC in the oxides exceeded basically uh, 70 Kelvin, and it was hoped that this is going to bring a lot of changes in the uh, application of superconductivity research. Unfortunately, these oxides are ceramic materials, and they are very hard to be ma uh, manufactured into wires. Um, uh, I, I'm not going to go over all this plot, but I am just kind of mentioned main breakthrough in, uh, in this area. So the next, uh, I should have also mentioned that these oxides have an unconventional, they are called unconventional superconductors, and the mechanism of superconductivity in these uh, materials is not phonon mediated. Yeah? It's not really known, but uh, it's known that it's not phonon mediated. Um, the next breakthrough in the area was in 2001 when a well-known compound, in this case magnesium diboride, so it was a compound that was in a lot of, uh, on the shelf of a lot of experimentalists, was found to be a super, uh, to have a uh, TC of 39 Kelvin, and that, this is uh, a phonon-mediated superconductor. Yeah, so this has been a, a had a phonon, uh, a major. Uh, in, uh, improvement in compared to the uh, superconductors that were known uh, in the 80s. Uh, the next uh, significant uh, 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 milestone was the discovery in, I believe, 2006 of iron-based superconductors. These are also unconventional, but still uh, unlike the oxides. And finally, uh, just uh, 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 recently, uh, superconductivity uh, has been discovered in um, sulfur hydride under pressure, and in fact, compressed sulfur hydride, and this is also a phonon mediated uh, superconductor. Yeah? So, this is just a general overview of uh, where the superconductivity uh, uh, research is standing at this, uh, this point. Um, I guess I should move also on this side. Um, so um, now, as I said, the next step we are going to talk about the BCS, uh, BCS theory of superconductivity, and this is the I think here we cannot hear no, uh, and this is the uh, the first uh, microscopic theory of uh, superconductivity. So the BCS relies, or the main assumption. The main assumption in the BCS theory is that there is some kind of attraction between uh, electrons that can overcome the, Cooper, uh, the uh, Coulomb interaction. And to see this very easily, we can look to see this uh, very easily, we can look at uh, two electrons uh, in a system. So for example, if we have uh, a crystal and we have an electron moving in one direction, then the electron is going to uh, create a deformation of the lattice with a net accumulation of a positive charge. As a result of this lattice deformation, another electron moving in the opposite direction will be attracted in this region of this uh, highest positive charge. As a result, the two electrons become correlated and they form what is called a Cooper pair. Yeah? So um, I should mention that in the BCS theory, the, uh, this uh, uh, pairing, like the type of pairing, um, the potential that creates this pairing is not really, uh, uh, it can be general, but in the case of conventional uh, superconductor, the pairing is due to the interaction between uh, electrons and this phonon vibration. Yeah? So this picture that I'm showing here is um, when the, the pairing is due to the, uh, uh, to the vibration, the coupling between electrons and uh, phonons. And um, so as I said, that uh, the two electrons become uh, correlated. 
and there are many such pair in a um, in a material. So since these electron pairs overlap over each other, they form what is called a highly um, collective condensate. So at very low temperature, this electron, uh, the electron can stay paired, and they, they can resist any kicks from the lattice. So in other words, the electrons can carry current without an, uh, energy loss. So yes, we will have this, um, uh, the resistivity in the superconductor is going to be uh, zero. Uh, so we can see also this pair formation. We can also present it in a simple This has I think the this has stopped working. Oh, okay, finally. Um, so we can also uh, look at the mechanism at the electron per, uh, per formation in this simple uh, diagrammatic representation. So in this case, let's say that we have an electron in a state K that emits a photon, and as, uh, as a result of this emission, it, it moves to a new state with momentum K prime. The photon will then be absorbed by another electron with momentum minus K, and, uh, and this electron will move in a new state with momentum minus K prime. So effectively, what happens is that two electrons uh, scattered uh, on each other by exchanging a phonon. And since the new, uh, since for this basically scattering to occur, we need to have that the state with momentum K prime and minus K prime need to be unoccupied. Yeah? And this can only happen if these states are in the vicinity of the Fermi energy. So basically, the electrons that form the Cooper pairs are within uh, a layer, or in other words, these active electrons uh, are only in a um, thin shell in the vicinity of the Fermi surface, and the thickness of this shell is determined by the, uh, character, uh, the characteristic phonon frequency of the material. So this is basically the, of the order of the largest phonon frequency in, in your system. So it's only of the order of milli electron volts. Yeah? For example, magnesium diboride, the highest phonon frequency is around 200 milli electron volts, just to to get a, a rough idea of what energy scale we, we are talking about. Um, <clears throat> so the, uh, so I, I should pause now and say that basically this uh, collective state that is formed in a, uh, is, is a key thing to bring uh, in superconductivity. Yeah? So if we don't have this Cooper pair formation, we are not going to have a superconducting state uh, in, a, in a metal. And finally, only also a general teacher. How do you do it? Ah, okay. We can, uh, we can compare the density of states in a, a normal metal and the density of states in a superconductor. Yeah, so in a normal metal, uh, or, uh, we have that the electronic bands below the Fermi level, all electronic bands below the Fermi level, are fully filled, while all uh, uh, energy bands uh, or energy states above the uh, Fermi level are fully empty. On the other hand, in the ground state of the, uh, in the BCS ground state, we have Cooper pairs. So in this case, uh, uh, while single electrons are uh, fermions and they should uh, obey uh, Pauli exclusion principle, um, electrons in Cooper pairs behave uh, are boson-like particles. So in other words, they can condensate and they can occupy the same energy level. Yeah? So as, uh, as a result, what happens is that um, a gap opens in the single particle excitation spectrum of a superconductor. Yeah? And this gap uh, uh, is this uh, two delta, and it, ha it depends on temperature. So we can see that, uh, uh, we will see the behavior in the, in, the next, uh, in the next plot. And basically, this two delta is the binding energy, the energy required to break 
uh, a, a Cooper pair. Yeah. So now again, uh, uh, if you want somehow to compare to to the uh, to a, a semiconductor here, this um, um, energy gap it's of the order of milli electron volts. Yeah. Where well, in a semiconductors, you talk about band gaps, which are order of a uh, fraction of electron volts. So it's, a, it's, it's, again, a different energy scale. And you should also notice that here there is a peak in the density of states. So this is because we are now moving these electrons from the states that were initially uh, this part, uh, occupy this part of the, of the valence band that right now is, is empty. Okay, so um, we can me uh, move a bit uh, further, and now it will become, start becoming more uh, formal with the theory and introducing some equation. But basically, this superconducting gap can be solved. <coughs> sorry, can be obtained uh, if one solve what is called the uh, BCS gap equation. So in this. This formula, we, you will see uh, that there are a number of indices, but it's quite simple. So, uh, I see. Ah, so, ah, maybe here even the sound is better. No, no, it's for, for the. For the <coughs> Sorry. So, as, um, so in this formula, uh, we can try to understand what each term represents. So delta <coughs> sorry, is the superconducting gap. And V is um, the, uh, the pairing potential. So this is the pairing potential that we said I mentioned earlier when I was describing that uh, uh, feature. And then E and K is the quasi-particle excitation which is expressed in terms of uh, energy eigenvalues, single, uh, single particle energy eigenvalues, and the superconducting gap. Um, and then you can see that we need to, uh, this has basically an anisotropic form. Yeah? So you can solve it for any index uh, band n and momentum k. And then here you need to sum over all uh, uh, phonons. Yeah? So it will be the q point. <coughs> So if you solve, if you were to solve this equation, which well, I'm not going to go through through the math this time, you will get uh, a function like this. Yeah, this is the behavior of uh, delta as a function of temperature, and what you uh, you can see is that <coughs> at uh, t equal to zero, the gap has a maximum, and at t equal to the critical temperature, the gap becomes zero, vanishes. Yeah. So once you pass, you, uh, the, your temperature goes beyond the critical temperature, you are in a normal state. So if you were to look at this uh, previous picture, you will end up again with a metallic system. Yeah? So your band gap is going, uh, will close. So just to summarize uh, briefly the BCS theory, um, this is a, uh, uh, this theory describes in detail the phenomenology of superconductivity. However, we, you should still keep in mind that this is a descriptive theory. So in other words, it's materials independent. And in fact, it predicts uh, this relationship between the superconducting gap at zero Kelvin and the critical, um, crit the critical temperature. And most importantly, the the method, the, uh, the model, the theory, does not account for the retardation of the electron-phonon interaction. So what does it mean? If you, if you remember the, the previous picture, when, sorry for going back and forth, when, if you remember this picture, I said that when electrons, uh, an electron moves to the crystal, the ions are going to also uh, move and they, they are going to uh, perform a deformation. So in other words, the time it takes for ions to move from, uh, to displace from their equilibrium position to their maximum displacement 
it's inverse proportional to the to the characteristic phonon frequency. So in other words, smaller uh, the characteristic phonon frequency of the material, larger uh, longer the time that it takes for an ion to reach uh, the, the, this displacement. Yeah, so longer the the retardation, and this. Um, this retardation effect is missing in the BCS model. Yeah? So it's considered that the electron phonon interaction is basically uh, instantaneous. Questions this far? So far, yes. So you can uh, then average over the Fermi surface, yeah, and you will get a simple gap like this. Yeah, in principle, you can solve it like this as well, yes. So, so just by looking at this, is, is it, so can I say that the energy required to break the silicon mechanism, say, at different transport directions is different? Uh, you can see an, an, an isotropy in the superconducting gap. So we'll see that later also in, uh, in the migdal diashber formulas, and I'm going to show some uh, results that will show you how the gap looks in when you calculate with all these factors with the anisotropy. This uh, will become more clear when I will show a few examples. And one of so by looking at this, is it possible that superconducting gap closes in one direction but still open in the other? But it, it depends on the Fermi surface, yeah. So the depends on the form of your Fermi surface. So in principle, Yes. So uh, right now, let's see how TC is in fact calculated in practice in uh, nowadays beyond the BCS model. And as I said, I will briefly go over the uh, Mac uh, macmillan allendines formula that you have already seen in, uh, I think, on, on, on Tuesday. So. Um, in this, uh, in this approach, we basically can evaluate or we can predict the, uh, the critical temperature. <coughs> I think if I stay on this side, somehow I can realize that uh, the, the, uh, I speak louder. I think it's the microphone is on this side. Sorry, I will have to point to this, uh, to this slide. Uh, so in order to calculate, to predict the superconducting temperature, we can do it once we know the electron phonon coupling strength. Yeah? And this, we can see, we, we saw that we can calculate ab initio. And an, the other parameter that enters in this formula is what we call the semi empirical uh, Coulomb pseudo potential. And this omega log is just an average uh, <coughs> phonon frequency. So, many, in fact, the majority of uh, ab initio calculation that exists in the literature rely on this formula. And the reason is that uh, it's quite, I mean, uh, all you need is basically a value for, for lambda. So it's easy to calculate, and it's been around for many years in quantum espresso. And I believe probably since you can cal estimate lambda, this can be done also with uh, ab in it. And this formula works reasonably well for isotropic uh, superconductors. And the reason why it works for isotropic superconductors is because <clears throat> it's been uh, determined or it's been derived based on the isotropic uh, parametrization from results for isotropic uh, uh, migdal eliasberg equations. However, you should need, uh, keep in mind that in order to, go, uh, to get a uh, converged value for lambda, and as hopefully you have uh, realized at the school, is that you require uh, very dense K and Q meshes. Uh, another thing where this critical temperature, uh, or sorry, this formula fails is that the critical temperature that we predict for an isotropic or uh, multi-gap superconductors will be wrong. Yeah, so it doesn't capture any an isotropy. Also, you only predict the TC. You don't really have any information about the superconducting gap. And then it also approximates the Coulomb interaction to a semi-empirical uh, parameter. Yeah? So this is usually chosen between 0.1 and 0.2 for most uh, materials. 
Now, uh, we can move on and finally start talking about the migdal Eliasberg theory. And this theory was developed in 1960 by Eliasberg that generalized basically the BCS uh, uh, theory of superconductivity by introducing the time uh, dependent electron phonon interaction that was developed by Migdal for the normal state. So uh, this formula for the pairing self energy, which is the central part where uh, we start with the uh, uh, in the Migdal Eliasberg theory, should have all should already be familiar since this has been shown in lecture uh, Feliciano's lecture on on Wednesday. Yes. Yeah? So this is nothing else but the fun Migdal self energy where the vertex gamma vertex was neglected yeah so this is the d is the dress phonon propagator g are the electron phonon matrix elements that we can uh, uh, we can calculate and <clears throat> this capital g this uh, operator this is the interacting greens function while this term here describes the electron electron interaction and basically it can be in principle calculated uh, is the gw self energy and can be obtained from uh, uh, GW calculation. Yeah? And the fact that we are neglecting, we are only keeping the first order terms in the electron phonon <laughs> self energy, if I my diagram for electron uh, self energy in superconductivity is called the Migdal's theorem. Yeah? It's referred to as the Migdal's theorem, and it's based on the observation that neglected terms of the order of the square root of the electron mass to the ion mass, and this can be shown that is proportional to the characteristic phonon frequency. This will be the Dubai frequency divided by the Fermi energy. So we talk about the ratio of MeV to uh, electron volts. Yeah? Now you need to keep in mind if electron, the, if the phonon energy is of the order of the Fermi energy, this approximation may break down because this is based on the adiabatic uh, approximation. Uh, as far as I know, there are no studies that have investigated uh, at which point the Migdal's theorem is, uh, uh, breaks, uh, breaks down. So uh, now we can, the next slides, I don't remember, four or five slides are, are uh, uh, quite in, intense with math, so if you don't get them, please don't get <laughs> desperate. It's if you later on you can uh, go through them and you can work out and you are you are going to realize that it's uh, the the formalism is not that uh, that complicated. Yeah. So this is the sorry. This is the uh, f uh, again the pairing self energy for the electron. Um, and what we can do as the first step, we can replace the uh, the phonon propagator, uh, or we can rewrite the phonon uh, propagator in its spectral representation. Yeah, and that's already uh, again. If you go uh, uh, yesterday's lecture by uh, by Feliciano, uh, he has already given this expression for the uh, phonon pro uh, dress phonon propagator, if I remember correctly, <coughs> and. Um, and, uh, and then uh, uh, another trick that we can do here, we can now introduce a new quantities that, we, uh, that couples G with the dress phonon propagator. And this we call the anisotropic electron phonon coupling strength. Yeah? So this, we can see that it has the electron phonon matrix elements. And, uh, and uh, compared, the, uh, we can see later on that this is basically uh, the, the same electron phonon coupling strength that we have seen before, only that now we keep the full anisotropy in, in, in the expression. Yeah? So it depends on the initial state, uh, nk, and the final state, nk plus q. So if these two equations are plugged in the... Uh, so uh, if <clears throat> we now use lambda, in the self-energy expression, we can rewrite it in a bit more compact form, where lambda can be easily calculated once we know the electron phonon matrix elements. And as I said, uh, the Coulomb interaction can be, in principle, calculated um, 
uh, through a GW approach. So what we are left right now in order to, uh, uh, to have to estimate the pairing self-energy, we need to find um, this uh, non-interacting uh, green function. Uh, uh, green function. Yeah? Um, so in the MIGDAL or in the superconductivity uh, state, uh, this is, um, uh, I would say, it's formally done or it's, uh, it's more easily done if we use what is called the uh, Nambu-Gorkos uh, formalism. So uh, uh, in within this formalism, we can describe the propagation of the electron quasi-particle and of superconducting Cooper pairs using a generalized green function. Yeah? So this is the generalized green function. And again, this looks quite familiar or it, uh, you have uh, to what we've seen on Wednesday. Yeah? So this tau, it's again, it's an imaginary time. This t tau is the VIX time ordering, uh, time ordering operator. And the only difference while uh, uh, on Wednesday, this was just a single uh, operator now is a two component field operator. So it has basically two components. One component destroys uh, an electron at the state uh, NK and spin up. And the other electrons, uh, sorry, the other operator creates an electron at the state uh, N uh, minus K and spin down. I, I forgot to mention, but uh, in the BCS model, it, it can also be shown that the Cooper pairs are formed not only of, or between uh, electrons with opposite momentum, but also uh, with electrons with opposite spins. Yeah? So this will become, uh, basically, this picture can be reduced to the, to the BCS, uh, BCS model. So now, if we replace, if we plug in this field operator in this, uh, in this expression, you can see that we have uh, a column vector multiplied by a line vector. Yeah? So this is just the complex conjugate. So what you are going to get is a two by two matrix uh, element. Yeah? And now let's uh, pause for a moment and try to, uh, let's try to understand the, <clears throat> the elements of this, of this matrix. So now if we look on the diagonal, what you can see is that you, can, you create and destroy, or here you destroy and create uh, electrons. But what is important, they are on the same state. Yeah? So this uh, should tell you that we are now talking about normal state green functions. And this, basically, they describe the single particle uh, electronic excitation that we will have in a normal uh, metal. Now, if you look at the non uh, off diagonal elements, you can see here that uh, you, uh, you either destroy or you either, uh, either create particles, but these are in uh, uh, sta different states. Yeah? So one state is with momentum k, the other is with momentum minus k, and then the, these are spin up and spin down. And uh, as I said, this is basically what, it, what we have when we form a Cooper pair. So this off-diagonal elements are called anomalous green functions and describe Cooper pairs amplitude. So basically, if, you, if these uh, uh, off-diagonal elements are zero, as I said, you will just have the behavior of a, of a, no, a normal metal. And uh, when this... Uh, elements, so, and these elements are basically non-zero only in the uh, superconducting uh, state. Now, since uh, this operator, this generalized operator in the imaginary time is periodic in tau, it can be expanded in a Fourier series. And mathematically, this is convenient because now we need to calculate this, uh, this matrix elements, what we call on the Matsubara frequencies, uh, frequency axis. Yeah? So uh, these are just discrete values. They are integer of j, and they depend on temperature. Yeah? So this is how temperature effects are introduced through 
through, uh, through, uh, through Green's function. And <clears throat> we can see here that larger the temperature, farther apart this uh, uh, imaginary frequency points uh, will be on the, um, uh, are on the imaginary frequency axis. And in fact, this can cause issues with convergence when you start doing numerical uh, calculations, when you have fewer and fewer uh, points in this sum, because at some point you need to truncate this sum, and uh, fewer points you have, harder will be for the algorithm to, to converge. <clears throat> so uh, what we are left with right now, as I said, we now need to estimate, to, to, uh, uh, to find this uh, generalized green function uh, as a fu uh, in terms of this uh, Matsubara frequency. And this can be done by uh, ev evaluated by solving the Dyson equation for electrons. Uh, so uh, in, in this expression, G naught minus one, this is the non-interacting Green's function. This is our electron self-energy, and this is the, uh, our interacting Green's function. And now it becomes uh, a bit uh, another formalism. What we do, we can, okay, we will do two steps. First, we are writing the uh, non-interacting Green's function, and uh, this only uh, uh, has basically a, di a diagonal form. If you can see, these are uh, Pauli uh, matrices. Um, and then we can also express uh, the self uh, pairing self energy in terms of a linear combination of um, uh, Pauli matrices as a function of three scalar variables. And this, uh, the, the name of these variables has kind of a historical reason, but for example, if we just ignore this term in the beginning, we can see that this term is diagonal, this is also diagonal, and uh, this comes from the normal state. And now this z, this mass renormalization, is nothing, it can be shown, if you do a bit of math, that it's related to the mass renormalization that we saw in the normal state. So this is the inverse of uh, one minus derivative of the real part of the self-energy with respect to the frequency. Yeah, so, and the second term is, this, is basically the energy shift. So this is just the real part, the eigenvalue plus the real part of the, of the self-energy. Yeah, again, what we've seen for the normal state. <clears throat> And this second term is the superconducting, uh, the, uh, the part that is related to the superconductivity, and this we can see that is non, uh, this is off diagonal. Yeah, so formally now we just introduce this expression for the uh, pairing self energy, and we, in, uh, we are replacing them in the uh, expression for the non-interacting Green's function. So remember that our goal was to find an expression for G that we basically, we can plug back in the self-energy. So we will go, we go kind of around the, the problem. Yeah, we will go back and forth, more or less. So once, if we introduce this uh, to expression in, in the G minus and you do an uh, inversion, now it's, this is a matrix. Yeah, remember that everything is basically a two by two matrix. So you can do a matrix inversion and what you find in this case, oops, what you find in this case is this G, where I, I just, that this denominator, since otherwise the expression would have looked, would have been too long, I just uh, wrote it separately. So now we, we have what we are looking for, yeah, so we have our expression for G, so we can go back to our expression for the self-energy, we plug it in, and now what we are left with, you can see that G uh, is still a linear combination in terms of the Pauli matrices. Here we have uh, uh, also Pauli matrices, so we can do, we just simply do uh, um, uh, multiplication of uh, three term uh, two by two matrices and the first term to tau three times tau naught times tau three gives us tau naught again. So here we are gonna have for this first term is going to be, sorry, this first term is going to be tau, uh, sorry, tau, 
still here is going to uh, be tau naught. Here it's going to remain. Uh, uh, I know here. Sorry, this was was tau naught. This is going to be tau three, and this, if we do tau three times tau one times tau three, this is again minus tau one. Yeah. So if you do this ma matrix multiplication, what you get is this uh, final expression for the self uh, self energy. So, uh, but basically, what we are looking for is this superconducting gap function. So, we, uh, so if we just stop here, we still don't really know uh, sigma. We just have a formal expression for for sigma. So, we need to still use our uh, other expression for sigma, where we just <laughs> wrote it as a linear combination. And what we, are, we can do right now, we can equate the scalar coefi uh, coefficients of the two expressions for sigma, and this finally leads to our Migdal, an isotropic migdal eliasberg equation. Yeah? So basically, what we are, we have three uh, equations, and you can see that they are, uh, two of them are coupled, and they are also, uh, if you were to solve this, you will need to do it self-consistently because uh, the terms z, chi, and delta, they appear both on the left and on the right side. Yeah, so, so this is quite complicated. And in fact, if you were to solve the, uh, this three equation, you also need to supplement the equation with, a, with another equation that I have not written down, but uh, this is for the total number of electrons in order to to evaluate, to find the, the Fermi energy. So in this expression, I think there is one term that I didn't mention, this NF. This is the density of states at the, at the Fermi level. Yeah. But luckily, we, right now, we can do some, some approximations. So we are not really going to solve these three equations. So, um, and there are a few standard, uh, standard approximations that one can do. And the first approximation is that only off-diagonal contribution to the Coulomb self-energy will be retained in order to avoid double counting of the Coulomb effects. And we are also going to work in the stat static screening approximation. So what this means is that the Coulomb contribution to the self-energy is only given by the tau-1 component of G, which uh, uh, by... Uh, definition is already of diagonal. So it means that in this uh, expression, so if this was the expression for Z that I had on the previous slide, basically the, contrib the Coulomb contribution in the expression for the uh, mass renormalization function vanishes. Yeah? So this is one uh, simplification. Second, uh, we are only working, if you remember in the first picture when I described the BCS theory, I said that uh, only uh, Cooper, uh, we are only interested in the electrons in the vicinity of the Fermi surface. So in other words, all quantities are going to be evaluated around the Fermi surface. So if you, in, uh, if you do a bit of math, you can show that chi, the expression for chi, vanishes when you do an integra uh, when you integrate it of the Fermi surface because this is an odd function. Yeah? So you are going to have the poles. And you will see that this, um, this function is going to be equal to 0. So uh, what this means, it means that out of uh, three equations, we are now down only to, to two equations. And uh, an, uh, another assumption that we are going to do is that the electron density of states is assumed to be constant. Again, this may not be the case, and uh, there are not uh, uh, too many studies. Uh, there are no studies that shows how uh, uh, this uh, really affects uh, the final results. But it's, it's quite an important approximation. And finally, uh, what we, uh, or at least the current implementation in the EPW, is uh, is uh, is based on the on the following approximation that the dynamically screened interaction it will be embedded in this semi-empirical uh, so the potential new star. However, you can still calculate, as I will show in, a, in a, towards the end of the talk, you, we can, in principle, we can still calculate this uh, new star 
uh, outside the PW uh, ab initial, but it is provided in the in the equation through 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 a parameter. So uh, to summarize what we are left, this will be our two uh, anisotropic gap equations, uh, sorry, anisotropic Migdal-Eliasberg equations, and uh, that we are left with, and this is what is implemented in inside the code. So Z, as I said, this is the mass renormalization function, and D and K is the superconducting gap, the same as, the, as in the BCS model. And again, we can see that the two equations are coupled, and uh, they, uh, and if you want to solve and to, you, uh, to get the superconducting gap, uh, or to solve them, uh, the, uh, the key parameter that we uh, have right now, or the key quantity that enters right now, is this anisotropic electron phonon coupling strength that is basically uh, is estimated based on the electron phonon matrix element. And you can formally also write this uh, lambda, an isotropic lambda, in terms of an, an isotropic Eliasberg spectral function. This is just to make a bit the connection with what you saw when you use uh, 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 the Macmillan expression when you estimated lambda from uh, the uh, uh, from Eliasberg spectral function. Yeah? So, uh, uh, to get to effectively get the superconducting gap, you will need to solve these equations at different temperatures. So you don't solve it just once; you will need to to solve it for different t. Yeah. So this can it can be quite time-consuming uh, since they will need to be solved every time for every temperature that you choose. You will need to solve these two equations self-consistently. Uh, second. Um, now you notice that we have this anisotropy, and this is the key point. So the equation will have to be solved on dense electron meshes, but at the same time, you also will need to do on dense uh, Q meshes to properly describe anisotropic uh, effects. Um, third, you also have this sum over the Matsubara frequency. And in, in principle, you should go to infinity, but in practice we can do that. So we'll need to be uh, to truncate this somewhere. And typically, we set this uh, frequency up to the point where, let's say, omega j prime is about. Uh, this is a convergence criteria that you'll need to check, but it's about four to ti uh, ten times the largest phonon frequency in your system. And I think I have one more point: is that then. You also need to pay attention that this z and delta are only meaningful for states near the Fermi surface. Yeah? So if you are to calculate this, for in fact, you can calculate them for uh, 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 energy states far away, but you can see that you have a delta function here. Yeah? So once you go uh, away from the Fermi surface, the delta function is zero. So you can take advantage of this and uh, only use a Fermi window when you evaluate this uh, this equation around near uh, near the Fermi surface. And I, and I will give in the uh, practical in the technical lecture I will give a bit more details about how this is done um, in in practice. So uh, so uh, uh, to simplify this, yeah, so, sorry, so this is the form of the final expression for the anisotropic case, but in principle, uh, you can uh, also right now perform a second average on the Fermi surface, and you can get uh, what is called the isotropic uh, uh, migdal eliasberg equation. Yeah? So these are the same, but now you see that there is no dependence on the uh, K or Q. And this is uh, directly connected uh, with the uh, expression that uh, Macmillan, uh, Macmillan expression, because right now this lambda is basically your electron phonon coupling state. So in the Macmillan expression, you just have this mu j equals zero. And, and now you, can you should rec be able to recognize the electron phonon coupling state. And the same here, this is just the isotropic Eliasberg spectral function. Yeah? So as I said in the beginning, the Macmillan TC, uh, and then later refined by Allendine, was found uh, as uh, 
solution or basically fitting to data obtained for, by solving the isotropic equation for some specific uh, materials. Yeah? So it's just an empirical fit through, through data obtained by solving these equations. So I think I'm almost approaching the end with this part of the talk about the theory. Is, uh, I, just to say a few things about the Coulomb interaction. So uh, as I showed in this uh, expression, I said that the, uh, if, if you look even here, we have replaced the Coulomb interaction by this uh, parameter, mu star. But in principle, this can be calculated uh, ab initio because... Uh, the screen Coulomb interaction can be calculated within the ran random phase approximation. So if we do that, once we have this matrix element, we can uh, estimate, we can do a double average over the Fermi surface, and we can calculate mu. And then the mu star can be defined in the model, moral anderson model, and it has uh, this expression. Yeah? So here, uh, uh, omega L, this is a characteristic uh, electronic uh, uh, plasma frequency. So this is of, of the order on electron volts. And this is, again, a characteristic phonon frequency. This is the order of milli electron volts. Yeah? And we have done a couple of uh, studies in which we have estimated this, uh, this value uh, in, uh, using this, uh, this uh, uh, approach. And then we have used basically a ab initio estimated, a first principle estimated uh, uh, semi-empirical Coulomb, so the potential that, then, that we then plugged in uh, the migdal eliasberg equations. Uh, so as a summary for, for the theory, can say that, uh, we can say that migdal eliasberg theory is, has predictive power, so it's material dependent. Um, yeah, I should have put an accent, but I forgot it, 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 that it, uh, it, it, in fact, I mentioned at the beginning to the MIGDAL uh, approximation, it accounts for the retardation of the electron phonon interaction. Uh, if you solve the equation in the anisotropic form, you can use it for anisotropic superconductors, and in other words, for multiband superconductors. Generally, it just uses, approximates its Coulomb interaction as mu star. In principle, the theory can be worked out to have this V calculated in, inside uh, the uh, migdal eliasberg equation, but it's not currently done. And it will require, uh, when you want to solve it in the uh, anisotropic case, it will require dense K and Q meshes yeah, in order to, to, reach, to reach convergence. Um, so uh, I will also just briefly describe another method that can be used to calculate, uh, to solve the superconducting gap uh, from uh, first principle. And this is called the density functional theory of superconductivity. And it has been developed in uh, Hardy's gross uh, group. So uh, the, central, uh, the central part, I would say, of the SCF-DFT is a superconducting gap equation. Yeah? And this formally, if you go back at the beginning of my talk, this looks like uh, very close to the BCS uh, gap equation. Yeah? So you can see that here we have just an extra term that did not appear in the BCS gap, but this delta is again the superconducting gap function. Z is something similar to this uh, mass renormalization function that we, uh, that we have in the migdal eliasberg uh, theory, and it accounts for electron phonon interaction, while this kernel, K, accounts for both electron phonon and electron electron interaction. Yeah, so, uh, um, so this can be solved also self consistently, but if you can see that in this case, we, you only have one equation that needs to be solved, so uh, not two equations uh, as in the uh, migdal eliasberg formalism. So the method is, uh, again, is, uh, is an ab initio method. So it has predictive power. It's material independent. Um, the way that it accounts for the retardation effect is basically through uh, exchange correlation functionals. Since, again, we have an isotropy, if you, can solve, if you solve it in a, an isotropic form, it works for uh, multiband superconductors. 
the nice thing about this method is, is that it treats, it really treats everything, uh, uh, both the electron phonon interaction and the electron electron interaction on equal footing. Yeah, so it has no uh, parametrization as, uh, as I show for the implementation of the anisotropic equation in EPW. However, it requires development of new functional to describe the electron phonon interaction. So if you take current functional, I guess, and if you use them, I suppose that they are not working. They won't work. And again, it will require dense K and Q meshes. Yeah. So I think I will uh, sorry, stop at this point. And then, so I can uh, take a break at this point, and then uh, we will see a few examples for calculation in the second part, and then we will go with the more practical implementation of these equations in the, in the code. So questions? <laughs> 